So just a caveat before we start, uh, typically this presentation runs um, eight to 12 hours for us. Um, so you're gonna hear in an hour and 15 minutes what it normally uh, would take eight hours or more to do. So I you- I you were gifted. <laughs> really gifted. So, <clears throat> um, as Heather said, um, so I come to this with uh, now 40 plus years of experience in terms of working in this particular area. I started my career working with uh, 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 kids and young adults with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in 1970 and 1971 when it was uh, not terribly well known. Um, I did my master's thesis on the behavioral effects of Ritalin in hyperkinetic children because at that time, the use of medication to manage behavior in children was pretty controversial. In the states, there were congressional hearings about it, and uh, so this is not new news in a lot of cases. Um, and the, what the interesting connection uh, for me was about that is, is that, that over the years, uh, you know, we've learned that, um, that uh, kids diagnosed, accurately diagnosed with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, are essentially the poster children for uh, executive skill problems. Um, I, my first exposure to executive skill problems actually uh, came out of working with uh, uh, children and young adults um, who had sustained traumatic brain injuries. Um, and it wasn't until uh, the early and mid 1980s um, with that population of uh, uh, traumatic brain injury, um, and with Frank Stuss's work in Toronto, where people began to realize that the frontal lobes and the prefrontal cortex really did a, account for something in the brain. Because before that, it was something of a question about what exactly this area of the brain was supposed to do. And what people realized is that if you subjected to the uh, frontal lobes, and particularly the prefrontal cortex, to sufficient damage, um, then basically, you essentially eliminated or at least seriously affected the self-regulatory capacity of people. And that became executive skills. And so executive skills as we know it today basically emerged out of that notion of, of traumatic brain injury and the effects, uh, because the, a lot of the effects were, were in the frontal areas of the brain and the effects on the frontal areas of the brain of that kind of trauma. Since then, it's gone through a lot of changes. Um, Peg Dawson and I, my partner, uh, and I did a presentation in 1985. Uh, we were working in, in both areas at that time. We were working in the areas of, of attention disorder. We were also working in the areas of traumatic brain injury. We did a presentation at uh, one of the large head injury conferences about the similarities that we noticed between what was referred to at that time as mild brain injury um, and uh, the, uh, uh, certain types of learning disorders, particularly those uh, that were uh, 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 part of a, an attention deficit disorder. Um, and in, in the early 1990s, Russ Barkley wrote a paper about that. That became a, a fairly popular notion. And it was through that time that people began to realize that this wasn't just an area that was uh, relevant to uh, kids and adults with various types of diagnosis. It was relevant to all of us. Um, and that all of us have executive skills and executive skill profiles and all of us have strengths and weaknesses in that. Um, I guess there's some irony in the fact that my, my son, who's 28 years old now, was born in 1987. Um, he was diagnosed in 1993, not by me, but by somebody else, with an attention deficit disorder. And so he has struggled throughout his life. Actually, he hasn't struggled throughout his life. When he was a kid, he wasn't bothered by this at all. I was bothered by it, uh, the fact that he had attention disorders. Um, but he has struggled with it, and he'd be the first one to admit that. I mean, he continues to struggle with it. Um, he and I are, are the primary co-authors co of, of this book about young adults, and that's because he has a lot of hands-on experience as a young adult struggling um, with executive skills and struggling to become independent. And so I won't talk a lot about him tonight, but this isn't just a, a professional and a, a intellectual interest for me. It really is a personal interest, and that's what's driven a lot of my work and a lot of my continuing interest in the area. Um, you know, he's a co-author on the teen book. That wasn't so much autobiographical. He just happens to be a good writer. Um, but to this day, he hasn't graduated from college. Uh, he's flunked out of college about three or four times at this point. 
Um, and it's not something he's particularly happy or proud about, but he, I, that's been a significant struggle for him. Uh, nonetheless, he lives independently and he manages reasonably well. You know, I tell people that, that if I knew when he was young what I think I understand now about executive skills, I would have done some things very differently as a parent. And so that's some of what I'm going to share with you tonight. Some of what I'm going to share with you is some of the thoughts that I've had about uh, what, what executive skills mean for kids and how we ought to think about approaching our kids. So let me get started. I won't take any questions during this unless something that I say makes absolutely no sense whatsoever and enough of you are baffled by it to ask. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm happy to take questions at the end. I'm happy to answer questions as a group or individually if you want to come down. So, um, Now, why have we chosen executive skills? We've chosen executive skills because as parents, we have certain goals for our kids. We would like them to grow up to be independent. and and. Reasonably well-developed executive skills are essential to independent living. We've understood that from, from all of the different populations that we've worked with. We want them to be self-sufficient members of a community. We want them to have satisfying interpersonal and work relationships. We would all hope for that for our children. And so Russ Barkley, uh, I use Barkley's definition because I have a lot of respect for Russ's work, um, and, but also because he, he's come up with some fairly concise notions about what executive skills are all about. Basically, he said that those self-directed actions needed to choose goals and create and act and sustain actions toward those goals. More simply, self-regulation to achieve goals. So I'm going to come back to this a couple of different times tonight, because and the emphasis is going to be on self. This isn't about us regulating our children's behavior. It's not about us teaching executive skills. It's about us working with our children so that they will learn to regulate their own behavior. And that's a very important issue. The only way that kids will acquire executive skills is through their own learning and experience, which means very early on in this process, they have to, be, have to play a role as decision makers. I'm not suggesting that you will abdicate your role as parents or as authority figures in their lives. I'm something of a control freak in the lives of my children, or at least I have been. They would both attest to that, my son and my 22-year-old daughter. Um, however, um, uh, that's a, it becomes a, a shared role, and more and more over time, it becomes essential that they really do become active players in this. Otherwise, they won't acquire the self-regulation. Let me not do this. This is this thing about Harvard. So I'm going to go through our executive skills scheme uh, and talk about this a little bit. The first three skills that I'm going to show you are the order in which they urge developmentally. It gets a little bit fuzzier after that in terms of the research because of definitional issues. Response inhibition is the first of the skills. It's the capacity to think before you act. Basically, the ability to resist the urge to say or to do something, um, it, it allows us the time to evaluate our reactions. In other words, before we say something or before we do something, do we understand what the potential consequences of that are going to be? Clearly a very, very important skill. Now, this is the first of the executive skills to develop, and it develops at about six months of age in infants. It clearly does not develop in this capacity. It develops simply as the, the ability to either respond or not respond. That's all, a, the, a very rudimentary capacity. Now, when we think about the development of executive skills, executive skills, like language, are essentially pre-wired in the brain. The, all things being equal, as long as the, the, the brain isn't subjected to some sort of toxin in, in the environment, either, uh, either psychological toxins or physical toxins, or some sort of trauma, that executive skills will develop in the same way that language will develop. Kids are not born speaking, and they are not born with a, uh, showing us executive skills. But they start to show executive skills, at least in rudimentary form, even before they acquire language. So, that emerges about six months of age. The second, working memory, uh, the ability to hold information in memory while performing complex tasks. So there are two aspects that we think about in terms of working memory. One of these is if I said to you, I want you to do an uh, arithmetic problem, I'm going to give you the problem, I want you to do it mentally, don't write the details down. You'd be utilizing some aspect of working memory to be able to do that. It's the ability to hold and manipulate information kind of online. 
from, from my perspective, from the work that I do, I'm more interested in the second part of the, this a definition. It incorporates the ability to draw on past learning or experience to apply to the situation he in or to project into the future. It's what Russ Barkley refers to as the capacity for hindsight and foresight. Now, our example of this is an 11-year-old girl says to herself on a Saturday morning, last Saturday, when I cleaned my room, mom let me invite a friend over and she took us out for pizza in the afternoon. Maybe if I clean my room today, she'll let me invite a friend over and she'll take us out to do something this afternoon. For a cognitively intact 11-year-old kid, that's not an unusual piece of thinking. It happens way quicker than it took me to relate that little antidote, antidote to you. However, when you think about it, it's remarkable cognitive act in terms of behavior regulation. A kid locates herself in a particular context, in a spatial and temporal context, and she reaches back into her experience a week. But it could have been two, two weeks or three weeks. It really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. She brings that past experience that she recalls forward. And on the basis of that past experience, she makes a decision about how she's gonna regulate her behavior in this particular situation, and she also makes a prediction about how somebody else is gonna respond in response to her behavior. That's really what the power of working memory is. Our goal as parents and educators is to, to help our children develop a repertoire of successful negotiations of problem situations that they can recall and use in the future when they're in a situation that has some similar characteristics. That really is what the power of working memory is all about. And that's what we're doing all of the time. We're trying to get kids to develop those kinds of things and to look back at that past successful experience and bring that forward. So in order to do that, they have to have, they have, to have stored experiences that were successful in terms of them overcoming a problem. Not that they can't use error sometimes to help them also in terms of what not to do, but it's more about what to do that becomes so, so critical. Working memory starts to develop at about, visual working memory starts to develop at about six or seven months of age. Prior to that time, the infant lives perpetually in the present. If it can't be sensed, can't see it, touch it, smell it, hear it, doesn't exist, out of sight, out of mind. But at least at that, around that age, they begin to develop a rudimentary capacity to be able to hold in visual working memory something, a, a situation, a person, an object that isn't immediate, immediately in their environment. The third emotional control we've defined as the ability to manage emotions in order to achieve goals, complete tasks, or control and direct behavior. We see this as a particularly critical, if you've got adolescent kids, you understand something about emotional control or the lack of emotional control. Um, and it's, it's particularly important characteristic because it's a unique, it's a kind of a unique application of response inhibition. Uh, kids who suffer from emotional discontrol are disinhibited, but they're emotionally disinhibited. So again, in infancy, this is thought to emerge somewhere in the six to nine month range, but it doesn't develop as this, as this kind of uh, regulation of emotions. It emerges as, uh, in terms of what the neuroscientists refer to as simply approach avoidance behavior. Does the child move towards something because they prefer it or away from something because they find it aversive? And the uh, people who work in the, in the uh, area of, of uh, neuroscience, at least to the extent that it's, it involves the development of emotions, uh, say, claim that, that all, our emotion, all of our emotions are uh, uh, developed ultimately along that continuum of is it a positive or a negative experience for us? So now you have an infant in the six to nine month range who is capable of initiating a response. They're capable of initiating a response and they can recall something that's not immediately present in their environment. And they've developed some sort of preference for or preference or, or aversion to particular situations. What else is happening in that kind of six to nine, six to 10 month range? They can move. And so if you're a parent, and you've obviously, you've all been through this experience uh, with your children. Um, what you start to notice at about eight months, nine months of age, kids start to make decisions for themselves. You have no idea where your infant is going. They certainly haven't told you where they're going. They haven't told you why they're going there. 
but they look particularly determined to try to get to some place. And it's the first experience that you have that your kids are going to make decisions without consulting you, which is really what their goal in life is. They want to make decisions without consulting you. Um, they become much more articulate about that later on. Although, you know, two, two and a half year olds, my son's favorite phrase was, I do it myself. I think that that's an that's in, inherent phrase in children. Um, and my son pointed out, uh, when he, was, he wrote the, uh, a lot of the chapters for the teen book, he pointed out, he said, you know, when you get to adolescence, uh, there's a slightly more sophisticated version of I do it myself. Like, mind your own business, I don't need your help with anything, stay out of my life. So the message is a little bit, more, I don't know if it's more articulate, but it's certainly more direct. Um, but it's essentially the same. I will direct my own life. And for the 25 years that kids go through development, basically that's what this process is. It's about them progressively taking more and more control of their lives, and as parents, we giving over that control to them. That's really what it's all about. Hopefully when they get to middle young adulthood, they're able to manage and we're able to manage it and we all are both still sane having gone through the particular process. Um, but it starts at this time. Now what's interesting about this time also is that this is where your role as a surrogate frontal lobe becomes quite obvious and that's what you are. You are a surrogate frontal lobe. I, I'm thinking now that I've got a 22 and a 28 year old, I will be in some, to some extent, the surrogate frontal lobe for my children for a good part of the rest of their life or for whatever is left of my life because it, you really don't give up that role. You think you're gonna give it up when they leave home and so forth, but it really doesn't happen that way. But for the infant, and for the, for, for the young child, and even for the adolescent child, that role is particularly important. Because what you're gonna do is you're gonna protect them from themselves. You're gonna protect them from, from the, for the fact that, that they do have some capacity to be able to initiate actions, they just don't have very good judgment about that. So even the very young infant who crawls after something, you don't know what they're calling for, stairs do, don't mean anything to that infant. And so we gate the stairs, you know, or we child-proof the bathroom. We do all of those kinds of things because they really, there's a, a part of them that has no awareness of what the dangers are in that particular world. We don't let our kids drive until they're 16 years old for good reason. Some states now have graduated driver licensing laws so that there's certain types of driving that you can't engage until you're 17 or 18 years old. Why? Because 16 year old drivers are dangerous. I have personal experience with that. <laughs> and so throughout their lives, you play that kind of role, whether it's through, through rulemaking or through the types of, of uh, uh, rules that society puts in place, to basically protect kids until they look like they're capable of managing on their own. Flexibility, this is the ability to uh, revise plans in the face of obstacles, setbacks, new information or mistakes, relates to an adaptability to changing conditions. It means the kids have tolerance for rapid changes in life. You know, for the kids who don't, for the kids who are somewhat inflexible, life can be quite difficult for them because they're made anxious by ambiguity. They're made anxious by uncertainty. When they want to know absolutely what's coming and they don't know what's coming, they will construct an agenda so at least they feel like they have some certainty. Once an inflexible kid has constructed an agenda, in their mind, that's going to happen. It's not a maybe, it's, it's this is going to happen because they have no tolerance for ambiguity. If their agenda doesn't happen to correspond to your agenda and you come along later with a different agenda, then that becomes problematic for them. These are the kids that Ross Green in his book, The Explosive Child, talks about. They're inflexible kids. Sustained attention, the capacity to maintain attention to a situation or task. The second part of this is critical. In spite of distractibility, fatigue, or boredom, it's not just the capacity to maintain attention to a task. The real question is, can you override distractions or fatigue or boredom to, to still be able to maintain your attention to a situation? 
task initiation, the ability to begin projects without undue procrastination in an efficient or timely fashion. Planning prioritization, the ability to create a roadmap. Now we're starting to get into the heart of what executive skills are really gonna be about in terms of the process. Uh, create a roadmap to reach a goal or to complete a task also involves being able to make decisions about what's important to focus on and what's not important. We hear our kids say all of the time, I wanna be, I wanna do, without much of any appreciation of what it would really take to be able to get to that particular, that particular goal. And we don't, we don't correct them all of the time about that. We don't make them set goals uh, because some of this is in the realm of fantasy. Even when we set goals sometimes for ourselves, they're in the realm of fantasy. You know, we don't backward plan to find out, are we really gonna do these kinds of things? They're just nice things to think about. Organization, the ability to create and maintain systems to keep track of information or materials. We don't recommend an organizational system. Basically what we understand is that if organization doesn't get in the way of efficient problem solving, then you have a pretty good organizational system. Time management, the capacity to estimate how much time one has, how to allocate it, how to stay within time limits and deadlines. Clearly a critical issue for kids, particularly as they move into middle school and high school, also involves a sense that time is important or what's referred to as a sense of time urgency. Particularly in middle school and in going into high school, you notice that, that kids that develop a particular kind of time distortion. They always overestimate the amount of time they have to do a task that they really don't want to do and they always underestimate the amount of time that that non-preferred task is gonna take. So do you have homework tonight? Yeah, I get algebra tonight. How long does it take you to do it? I don't know, maybe 20 minutes, half hour? When are you gonna start? It's only three o'clock, I got plenty of time to start. <laughs> Adolescent kids don't make time distortion mistakes in your favor. They make time distortion mistakes in their favor. The capacity to have a goal, goal-directed persistence, this is really what it's all about. Capacity to have a goal, follow through to the completion of that goal, and not be put off or distracted by competing interests. So we're gonna come back to this issue because what we're gonna talk about is this is really ultimately where we want our kids to get to. Can they set a goal and persist to, to the point that they accomplish that goal? When I mentioned response inhibition before, response inhibition is the beginning of goal-directed persistence. In order to have good goal-directed persistence, kids do need to have developed response inhibition early on. It's really, it's the capacity for a little bit of delayed gratification. And then finally, metacognition, the ability to stand back and take a bird's eye view oneself in a situation. It's the ability to observe how you problem solve, include self-monitoring and self-evaluative skills, asking yourself, um, how am I doing, how did I do in this situation? We are advocates of kids very early on evaluating their own performance. As young as five or six years old, how did you do? How do you think you did? The only thing I would say to you is if you're gonna to try to do this with very young kids, they have to have a specific behavioral reference point to do that. And so, you know, I gave the example this morning that I work with, uh, I do a lot of work with little boys on the playground who have impulse control problems and they tend to bump into other kids, not out of aggression, just because they're, they're exuberant and they don't have very good motor control and so forth. And so, um, I, 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 a teacher may come and say, well, this kid keeps knocking these kids over in the playground, it's, it's gonna get to be a problem. And so, maybe the kid and I sit down and we brainstorm a solution. You know, and the solution has to be that you're not gonna knock kids over, otherwise you're not gonna be able to go out to recess. So we work something out, and <clears throat> I say to the kid, you know, you did a really nice job with that yesterday. So let's start to keep track of your behavior. Let's, let's create a scorecard for your behavior. Let's say a two is when you go out onto the playground and you don't even bump into anybody on the playground. A one is when you bump into somebody on the playground, but Teacher says to you, no, you can't do that, and that's the only time that you bump into somebody. A zero is when you knock one or more children on the playground down, okay? So if I ask a kid to evaluate that behavior, now they have a, a very specific reference point about that. In terms of working memory, I was talking about working memory before. So if the kid and I have come up with, we brainstormed some sort of solution for how this kid is gonna manage this situation, and it worked the first day, 
I say to the kid the second day, just before he goes out, so do you remember what you did yesterday? You did a really nice job out there yesterday. What did you do yesterday that, that worked for you? Just by virtue of that kid telling me what he did, that is a rehearsal of the behavior he's about to do again. That's how you're looking to utilize working memory all of the time. What did you do? What worked? And now on the back end, let's see how you did. Why is it important for, to help kids develop executive skills here? Dale's fourth grade education pays off. The job you're applying for will require you to know, long division, state capitals, and cursive writing. It's not likely for Dale. The, the prediction is that this current generation of young adults will change careers four to six times prior to the time that they get to retirement. And we're not talking about just small changes in career. They could actually shift careers in a major way. So that not only means varying skill sets, it means it puts an enormous amount of stress on executive skills. The executive skill demands that our kids are facing are far greater than the executive skill demands that we faced when we were growing up. That's the truth of it. And so when people talk about how come these kids today don't have very good executive skills, it's not just that they don't have very good executive skills, that they don't have good executive skills, is that the demands are far greater than they used to be on this particular skill set. That's why we're, so, we're, we're advocating that it's so important for kids to learn these skills earlier. The areas in the brain that, uh, that play a key role in executive skills, I said primarily but not exclusively, the frontal brain systems. Again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I'll talk a little bit about it. So in terms of the development of executive skills, this is what we understand. This is a, a grossly oversimplified version of what goes on in the brain. But one of the things that's associated with the development of executive skills is this development of myelin. Myelin is a fatty sheath that surrounds an axon, which is the transmission fiber that comes out of a cell body. So those hot dog looking like structures on that, that long uh, wire there um, are, uh, 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 represent myelin. And what happens is that the, the, the frontal lobes, and particularly the prefrontal cortex, are the last areas of the brain to become fully myelinated. It happens somewhere in the mid-20s of young adults, typically developing young adults. And the development of executive skills, I'll show you a chart in a little while, the development of executive skills from a behavioral perspective parallels the development of Myelinization, myelination, myelinization in the frontal, in the, in particularly in the prefrontal cortex. So we do understand something about that. What myelin does is it facilitates the efficiency of transfer of, of nerve impulses down that axon. So that, as it turns out, a fully myelinated axon is 3,000 times more efficient in terms of its transmission of the signal than an unmyelinated axon. More recently, what we've learned is that practicing a skill over and over again seems to enhance the myelinization of, a, of the pathways which underlie that skill in the nervous system, which is all the more reason for people to practice skills that you want them to learn, okay? Now, so we've said the more you practice, the better the skill. Practice also makes the task less effortful. Part of the reason why it becomes less effortful is because it is better encoded in the brain. Two other things happen in development that are important. In, in the young child, in the early preschool years, and in the pre-adolescent, um, let me back up a little bit. So, this highlighted area here that you see is a synapse. So what happens is a nerve impulse travels down the axon, gets to this terminal at the end of the axon, um, and those little packets of chemicals that are neurotransmitters are released into the synapse. If it's the correct, uh, if it's the correct postsynaptic membrane, then those neurotransmitters in a lock and key fashion will attach to the postsynaptic membrane and the signal will be propagated down the next neuron and, and so on. And that's how uh, nerve so, nervous system transmission takes place. <clears throat> 
in the very young children, in, in preschool children and in pre-adolescence, there's an a, a enormous multiplication of those synapses. The reason why that's thought to happen is because it sets up the brain for a lot of learning. But potentiates a lot of learning in, in the, this kind of latency age child and also in the adolescent and the young adult. It's a phenomenon called synaptogenesis. So you get this huge proliferation of synapses. When, when the skills, when, when pr certain skills are practiced over and over again, then those synapses survive. When they don't, then they're basically pruned away. And so that pruning process takes place twice. It takes place from the, as I say, early preschool years, probably from three through 10, 11 years old. And then there's a second period of synaptogenesis that occurs in the pre-adolescent period. And then all the way through adolescence and young adulthood, as they go through this process of learning, those synapses are pruned away again. And so those are two really important times in terms of us working with children and children working on their own skills. So through adolescence and even into early young adulthood, you've got opportunities to work with kids on these kinds of skills and to, to help them better develop them. <coughs> now this is uh, out of a book by uh, uh, the Andersons. Um, on executive skill development, what you'll see is that the, the, the most complex of these skills, number four, uh, goal setting and problem solving that we, we call a combination of goal-directed persistence probably in metacognition, is not fully developed until sometime between 24 and 28 years of age. <coughs> so even though we're thinking that our adolescent kids ought to sometimes be able to do more than they're able to do, in fact, they're, they're following a typical course of development and these skills won't be developed, well developed, fully developed until mid-young adulthood. I'm not gonna talk a lot about assessment. Um, I'll mention one thing. Peg and I developed a, 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 an executive skills checklist, a behavior checklist for adolescent kids, actually for late middle school and for high school kids. We did this with the help of parents and teachers and the kids themselves. The reason why I'm gonna show you this now is I'm gonna refer to it later on. When you're trying to work with your kid on developing a particular executive skill, you're not gonna work on the general skill. I don't ever work with kids on developing better sustained attention or better response inhibition or better working memory. I have to know what behaviors that they manifest that represent those kinds of skills. So if a kid is struggling with sustained attention, I wanna know do they take too many breaks? Do they take breaks that are too long? Are they internally distracted? Are they externally distracted? Is it, is it social media? Is it TV? Is it sports? What exactly is their particular form of distraction? Because that's where you're gonna intervene. That's where they're gonna need help. It's rare that kids will have all of these different ones. We've, we've used this uh, now with a few hundred kids, parents and teachers. And what we understand is that typically, under a weak executive skill, kids will endorse two or three of these. Interestingly enough, parents in, tend to endorse the same two or three. It's one of the few times that in adolescence when you see agreement between parents and their kids. Um, those are the, the areas that we choose, in, we intervene with, or our parents understand that where they're gonna have to intervene. So that's all I wanted to say about assessment right now. What do executive skill weaknesses look like in kids? Again, they act without thinking. This is the more behavioral side of executive skills. Response inhibition, flexibility, um, emotional discontrol, um, they resist change of routine, talk or play too loudly, out of control more than peers, uh, low tolerance for frustration, get overly upset about little things. These are the more absent-minded kind of kids, the more inattentive kind of kids. Don't write down assignments, forget directions, forget to bring materials home, lose stuff, messy notebooks, uh, lose books or papers or notebooks, sloppy work, uh, leave long-term assignments until the last minute and so forth. Now, here's how development comes into play with kids. When, we, when you think about children, 
we refer to two aspects of attention or behavior. One of them is what's referred to as context-dependent behavior or context-dependent attention. The other one is goal-directed persistence. In context-dependent behavior, it means that your behavior, your, your behavior in a particular situation is primarily driven by what's going on in that situation right at that time, okay? Whereas if you have good goal-directed persistence, your behavior is under the control of some future goal and not under the control of the current situation. That's a very important, because as kids age developmentally, they move more and more away from context-dependent behavior and more and more into goal-directed behavior, hopefully. The place where this breaks down a little bit is with adolescent kids. And part of the reason why it breaks down in adolescence is because peers become all important. And peers are the most powerful context for kids. And their behavior is completely different when they're alone with peers in, as in comparison to when they're alone with adults. So let me talk about that a little bit. In, in context-dependent or contingency-shaped attention, a person's sustained response depends on novelty, because the brain's a novelty detector, intrinsic interest. If you're intrinsically interested in a situation, your behavior will reflect that, your attention will reflect that. You know, if you're interested in this topic tonight, in spite of the fact that it's late, you know, you've had a glass or two of wine, um, you'll still maintain some degree of attention. Hopefully, you know. Why? Because it, the topic is of interest to you because you, there's some piece of information that you want. So what happens right here, right now is important, okay? Or some sort of extrinsically provided consequences. I'm guessing that not everybody came for, or not anybody came for the wine tonight, but you know, who knows? Um, if I were walking around handing out uh, 20 or $50 bills, to those of you who look like you were paying really, really good attention, then I can manipulate your attention as an audience to some extent. It's not gonna happen, but I could do that. <laughs> so if it, for kids, if a task is fun, or if they find it interesting, or if it's immediately rewarding, there's no problem keeping them on task. It's true, isn't it? Think of the stuff that your kids like to do. They don't look like they have an attention problem when it comes to that. It's only when they're asked to do the stuff that you want them to do, or their teachers want them to do, that it looks like suddenly they've developed an attention disorder. You know, that's, and that's why. And so in some cases, all you're gonna have to be able to control is the context. That's where your role as a parent comes back in. You know, to the extent that all of the distractions that are attractive to kids are available to them, it's very hard for them to pay attention to things that are less interesting to them, particularly in this day and age. And so your role is to make sure that the environment that they operate in, you know, doesn't have all of those distractions all of the time. Because they're not gonna be able to manage them all. You know? Multitasking is a myth. That, that, that really is true. There's very good research to indicate that when people think that they multitask, they're inefficient at all of the tasks. <coughs> so the question is all of the time, what does the child find tempting? And you have to control the context, the environment, to at least eliminate that, that degree of temptation. Goal-directed persistence is very different. You know, as I said to people this morning, so first, I'm pretty careful about my diet, particularly when I'm traveling. It's because of some health issues that I had a long time ago. So <clears throat> carbohydrates would be the death of me, particularly simple carbohydrates, white breads. You know, I said to people, my favorite dish in the world was Thomas's English muffins grilled in a frying pan and then re-buttered. It's just, a, it just didn't get any better than that for me, you know. And any of the substitutes, you know, bagels, you know, homemade bread that my wife made, pies, cakes, um, all of which 
are not part of my diet anymore because it's a slippery slope. Um, so like this morning when they had uh, uh, snacks out for, for breakfast, I could tell you everything that was out there for carbohydrates, you know, because I know I'm vigilant about what's out there, you know, but I have a plan when I go out there. And so I eat the fruit. That's what I do. I have to do that. At home, those kinds of carbohydrates don't ever come into our house. That's actually not true. There are two times when they come in. Thanksgiving and Christmas they come in because those are diet holidays as far as I'm concerned. You know. White bread has been absent for so long in my house that, that when my daughter, from the time my daughter was young and living at home, on her birthday she asked for a loaf of Wonder Bread. That is the, that's the truth. And the reason why she asked for a loaf of Wonder Bread and she hoarded the loaf <laughs> is because she felt that as an American child, she was deprived of the fundamental right to eat as much white bread as she wanted. That's. So I control my context at home. I'm quite careful about doing that. The other thing that you won't find in our house is ice cream, at least on a regular basis. Because when I was a child, I went through a period where I was eating pretty close to a pint of ice cream a day. So my mother was fairly indulgent about some kinds of things. So, um, but that became a contextual issue. And so once we got that under control, once I got it under control, then I eliminate those kinds of things. But on the road, it's much harder to control your context. But the context is important and the plan is important. And so for me, the goal is, do not get home on Sunday or Monday and get on the scale and find out that I've put on five or 10 pounds. Because it's happened on other trips. And I don't want that to happen. I also have a physical with my doctor on Monday and I really don't feel like being berated by my doctor as a result. So if you have a goal, kid has a chemistry test on a Sunday, his friends call him up. I'm, I'm, you know, I walked outside today. You know, we had 10 feet of snow in, in New Hampshire <laughs> where I live. Um, and we don't even live in a snowy area with 10 feet of snow this year. And so everything is still brown. So I come here and I say, oh my God, I'm stunned by how green it is. You know, it looks like the Kentucky Derby here. Um, <laughs> so you can imagine how deprived of weekends kids, kids in New Hampshire feel at this point. So a kid's got a chemistry test and his friends call him up and they say, let's go out. Come on, we'll just go out Sunday after. We'll just hang out for a little while. I can't, I got a chemistry test. Ah, come on, you know you're gonna do okay. I, I can't, I really gotta stay in. Come on, we promise we'll bring you back by five o'clock. Sure, that's gonna happen. So the kid says no. And in order to do that, he's gotta have a mental representation of his goal in mind. The goal being do well on the chemistry test. Why? Maybe he's gonna major in some science in college. Maybe he understands that getting into college to be able to do that requires a good grade in chemistry. So he's reasoned all the way back from what may be a long-term goal to what immediately has to happen in a situation. That's where we would like our kids to be. To understand that there's a relationship between what I do right here, right now, and what that longer term goal is in the future. That's really what we're shooting for all of the time. So he's gotta formulate a plan and a set of rules to follow. I have a plan, he would need a plan. I know my friends are gonna to call today, I gotta to tell them that I'm not gonna go. He's got to inhibit and regulate negative affect because he's going to feel deprived. It's nice out. He'd like to be out. This is the first decent weekend. His friends are out hanging around. So he's going to feel like we would feel deprived if we have to work on a weekend or something like that. He also has to kindle some sort of self-motivated or positive drive state. It has to say, in spite of the fact that I feel deprived about this, what I will get out of this is good for me. And then finally, if the plan doesn't work, he's gotta come up with another plan. So that's really what goal-directed persistence is all about. And so as adults, we're trying to work with our kids to move from that kind of context-dependent be behavior situation to the goal-directed persistence piece. So if you've got good executive skills, you, could for you have good forethought, you have good planning, you have good goal-directed actions. People who have good executive skills, we deprive them as having good self-discipline, good willpower, good persistence. 
regardless of interruptions and regardless of a lack of immediate reinforcement. So that means, at least for some things, my behavior, in spite of whatever temptations are in this environment right now, is under the control of a future goal. If, there, if our kids get to that, then we're pretty much home free. So, in terms of the successful development of uh, executive skills and self-regulation, you want to know, you want to decrease in the extent to which behavior is under the control of the immediate environment. The first step in the development of the process, as I said, is response inhibition. Kids, young, young kids have to learn response inhibition. And an increase in the extent to which behaviors are under the control of a future goal. That's really what you're looking for. That's why we would recommend that parents work with their kids on kids setting goals. Not just the goals that you want, because that's going to get to be a harder and harder sell, but even the goals that they want. You know, my wife, when she's working with her kids, my wife's a, a, a teacher, she works with kindergarten and first grade kids. To give them an example of what it's like to set a goal, she says to them, what would you guys like to get good at? You know, five and six year olds, what are they talking about? Learning to swim, riding a bike, you know, learning to throw a ball, learning how to play a game. So she will take a kind of consensus about something the kids want to get better at, and she walks them back through a plan. So that they will begin to understand that even something as simple as saying, I, I want to learn how to swim, takes some degree of planning on somebody's part. She does that so that they will begin to appreciate the fact that if you, when you talk about accomplishing a goal, you have to do some planning for that goal. So kids setting goals, not the fantasy goals, you know, I, I, you know, I, I want to be, you know, I, I want to be one of the Kardashians, I, God forbid. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I want to be a sports star, you know, I, I want to be an actor, I, you know, I want, the, kids do that kind of stuff all of the time, you know. I'm talking about when kids, set, uh, to have them work on small goals, tell me something you want to accomplish, something that's important to you and then give them the opportunity to plan and to work on those kinds of goals. That is really what, what will help the development of executive skills in kids. Fortunately, with little kids, you know, they're, they're, they're much more willing to listen to you. And so you can sell them your goals. Well, could we work on this? You know, and then they'll be, willing, they'll be willing to do that. When I said before, if I knew then what I understand now, this is one of the things that I would have worked with on my son. I would have worked on goal-directed persistence, little things. Because he had goals, but if he walked away from them, then I, it was not a big deal to me. And that was a mistake. Because to this day, he struggles with goal-directed persistence. So any goal of the child or adolescent serves as a vehicle for developing executive skills. Keep that in mind. You know, so I said to somebody this morning, you know, what, what, what's a typical adolescent kid want? A lot of them want their license. Start to finish planning out that whole process of getting a license, arranging your schedule, finding out what, what, what driver education classes are going to cost, finding out what your insurance is going to cost, so forth. There's a lot of planning that goes into that. There are a lot of executive skills that go into those kinds of things. Those are good things for kids to work on. I'm not saying just hand it off to a kid. Some kids wouldn't be able to pull it off but give as much of it over to them as possible. When my kids were adolescents, I started to let them set up their own doctor's appointments. I wanted them to have that kind of contact. Let them relate to the people out in the community that they're ultimately going to have to relate to as adults. Let them appreciate what that process is about. Besides that, they listen to experts in the community better than they listen to you anyway. The factors which impact the degree to which you're going to act as a surrogate frontal lobe, your child's age and developmental level, so the younger they are, the more of a surrogate frontal lobe that you're going to be, um, your child's executive skill profile and the baseline of current strengths and weaknesses, if they have some sort of educational weakness or handicap, the extent to which uh, they have an educational weakness, the task, the situational, the environmental demands on the child, goodness of fit with the child's profile, and current environmental modifications in place. I'll come back to some of that. So, 
A friend of mine who teaches at a school in, in uh, Toronto called Moncrest, where they've integrated executive skills, she took this, she, she knows a great deal about executive skills. She took this picture of her son, you can't see a very good indication of it, but that's her son's graph of executive skills. That's his strengths and weakness in terms of executive skills. And her, the caption she sent me was, wouldn't it be great if, if all of our kids came home <laughs> with this t-shirt, you know? So we knew exactly what their profile is. It'd be even better if you had a t-shirt with your profile on there. So they could see what your strengths and weaknesses are and you could see what their strengths and weaknesses were. That would be ideal. That's the ideal way to get a sense about what kids are about in terms of executive skills. Doesn't happen though. These are the factors that impact all of our executive skills. Stress, fatigue. So if you understand something about your own executive skills, your executive, your weakest executive skills will look that much worse under conditions of stress or fatigue, as will children's skills. Depression and loneliness. Lack of physical fitness and poor health, interestingly enough. So we've, we now understand that there's a direct relationship between physical health and cardiovascular exercise, for example, and the development of executive skills in both children and adults. That's, a, that's an important thing to keep in mind. That means exercise and nutrition become important factors if we're expecting halfway decent brain development. And trauma, physical or emotional, because it does have all, both of those uh, cause uh, decrements in executive skills, and then the various diagnoses, ADHD, uh, 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 autism spectrum, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, mood disorders, and so forth. I want to mention context for one reason. If you want your children to learn and to use executive skills, teach the skills in that context where you want them to use them. There are no shortcuts to executive skills. I'm sure you've seen and heard the ads for luminosity, you know, for all of these brain games that are out there, you know, for all kinds of things that are supposed to enhance the executive skills of kids. There is simply no data whatsoever that they work beyond something that's referred to as narrow transfer. Computerized tasks that purport to train working memory work very well for other computerized tasks that involve working memory or for sustained attention, but they don't transfer to the real world. That's what the best available research out there says now. If you want your kids to learn executive skills, they have to learn them in the world where they're gonna be using them ultimately. If you're successful as a, frontal, a surrogate frontal lobe, you'll know that you're successful when your kids don't need you anymore. Which means that once your kids reach the stage where a particular skill or a particular behavior is something they're independent at, then you can get yourself out of the situation. They, they've managed that. And that's really what you're trying to do all of the time. You're always asking yourself, how can I be less involved in this process? It's funny because over the generations now, we've become more and more involved in our kids' lives. And it, it, on the one hand, it probably contributes to some extent to their academic and their, their, social, their uh, social achievement, but it doesn't do much of anything for their executive skills. There's good data about that. They don't learn to manage themselves. They learn to depend on adults. We've got like 15, 15 minutes, okay. Yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about strategies. I also wanna, I wanna go through these. So, <clears throat> what I said before, if you're gonna think about teaching executive skills, I'm gonna come back to interventions for executive skills in a second, but if you're gonna think about teaching executive skills, these are the things that are important. First of all, you gotta know what your kids' strengths and weaknesses are. You gotta know what the profiles are. 
Um, if you don't have executive skills questionnaires available to you, I sent Heather a set of questionnaires, kid questionnaires and questionnaires for you to take because you should understand something about your own profile. Here's something to keep in mind. If you have a strong executive skill that's a weakness for your kid, from your perspective, it's going to seem like an easy issue to manage. You can say to you could even see you'll end up even saying to your kid, well, just do this. Because for you, it's a just do this. I'm very good at task initiation. My son is very poor at task initiation. And so that's what I would say to him. Well, just do this. <coughs> when he was young. I did that all the way through adolescence. I'll tell you something else that happens. As kids get older, if you're good at a skill and you suggest to them, to, 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 to them that they should do something and they don't do it, it starts more and more to look like a motivation issue on their part. It looks like they're not trying hard enough. And that changes the character of the way that you frame that. So now, this really does look like something they could do it if they really wanted to, they don't, and that's a mistake for a weak skill. And so that's why you want to understand something about your own executive skill profile and something about your kid's profile. Just because it comes easy to you doesn't mean it will come easy to them. Once you understand something about what the weak executive skill is, you've got to understand how it manifests itself in terms of behavior, because that's where your intervention is going to be all of the time. You have to identify the situation that, or the task that requires the use of the executive skill. So when does your kid need to pay attention? You know, when do they need to be organized? What's the most critical issue? And you always work with them in the area that's the biggest impediment to their successfully getting through life, whatever that is. If it's their academic life and that there's, there's a weakness in a skill, then that's what you're going to work with them on. What's the, if you're going to practice, you're going to have kids practice the skill, the practice of a weak executive skill is an effortful task. The energy that's associated with that practice is depleted fairly quickly, which means your sessions have to be short. If you think you've come up with a, a, a strategy for your child to be able to correct a weakness in a particular area that reflects an executive skill and you think they're going to do that across the board, they will not. You know, the literature is very clear in indicating that doesn't work because it requires too much effort over too long a period of time have to practice short, they have to get good at it in short spurts in order to extend it out to more. And then the, the, they have to be able to appraise their performance in the situation. So we think about three types of interventions for executive skill. You intervene at the level of the environment. Why? Well, the first thing is, is that when you, if your kid, for example, is distracted, and you put them into an environment where there are a bunch of distractions, you automatically overtax their executive skills. So if the environment's a bad fit for a particular kid, then do not subject them to that environment if you can help doing that. You have to take them where they're at initially. We don't think about environmental modification, but that really is the first thing. Don't ask them to do tasks that are a weakness for them to begin with if it's possible to modify the task demand. You're not going to do it forever, but you've got to give them a chance to get their feet under them. Then you can intervene at the level of the child. You're going to work with them on developing the skill. The third thing, motivating the child to use the skill. For kids who have weak executive skills, it's going to be effortful to work on them. They're not going to be dying to work on these kinds of things. They're already struggling with it. In some cases, they might be failing with it. So we talk about motivating them to use it. In some cases, what we're talking about is creating some sort of an incentive. That might be as simple as a schedule. As soon as you do this, you can do this. Give them something to look forward to.
with thinking back to it. So I went through these, let me go through these quickly again. You identify the weak executive skill, or you identify the specific problem behavior. You get a baseline of the kid's current performance. You have to understand what they're capable of currently doing. Depending on the skill set, decide, <clears throat> set, you gotta set a goal. What's your goal for your kid? What do you want your kid to be able to do? What is it that they can't do now that's a reasonable goal that they should be able to do in a week, two weeks, three weeks. You have to know that specifically because you're gonna tell them specifically what that's gonna be. You want to identify that for them. You know, people have said to me before, so, so my kid says he wants to handle this or she wants to handle this, what should we do? Give him a shot. Adolescent kids you know, do that all of the time. Give him a shot at handling it. You don't, don't just give him a shot at doing that indefinitely. When we wrote the teen book, we asked high school kids to critique it for us. We wanted their feedback about how realistic they thought the scenarios and the solutions were. And one of the things that they told us was that you should give kids the chance to solve their own problems for about two or two and a half weeks. And revisit that at two or two and a half weeks. And if they haven't solved the problem at that point, Make it clear at the very beginning of this plan that if they, they can't manage it in that time frame, then you guys are gonna step in, you're gonna come up with some sort of solution that you think is gonna work. Yeah, well, you know, I... Sure. You know, and again, I, I think that you have to, you're still going to have to start with the kid. I don't want to get into too many specifics here because we could do a lot of individual problem solving. But, you know, the, the, when you get to adolescence or even with young kids, a, a lot of the problems affect the whole family. You know, I spend a lot of my time teaching morning routines to, to parents and kids, you know. But again, I, you know, I, we, I do have, I mean, I, I'll walk you through a, a, a kind of menu for how to do that. But part of it is about identifying what the routine is. The second part of it is, I know this is gonna strike some people as, as not the way to go. What's the incentive for the kid to do the routine? You know, people say, well, is it right to bribe a kid? I, I, I don't live in the world of bribery, fortunately. You know, I'm a behavior analyst. You know, it's got a term. Our euphemism for bribery is reinforcement. <laughs> You know, works for me, <laughs> you know. Takes all of the emotion out of it, you know, it's, it's justified by the literature, very effective principle, so. But I, I really do believe that, you know. I'm working in a world where kids, including my own kids sometimes, are unmotivated to do something um, because the task is effortful for them, you know. I don't, I, I understand, part of the reason why we use reinforcement is because it's a way to help kids sustain effort when they, when they can't muster the effort on their own. I don't worry about whether it's the right thing to do or not. You know, if you can convince your kids that it's the right thing to do and that's working for you, more power to you. I, I'm not a patient person when it comes to that kind of stuff. If somebody wants a solution, I'm gonna come up with a solution for you. People worry about reinforcement. They say, oh my God, this is gonna turn into extortion. <laughs> <clears throat> it only turns into extortion if you've already been extorted and your kid understands that you're a certain weakness for giving in to them. You know, somebody asked me a question this morning. They said, well, what do you do? I mean, you know, like a, a, a lot of the people here are affluent and their kids have a lot of what they need, you know? I'm all in favor of deprivation. You know, deprivation is what makes incentives possible. It's very hard to create incentives for people who don't need anything. You know, that's, that's the reality of it. You know, and so even if you have to artificially induce deprivation, it's okay, I mean, that's a, you know, now, you know, it used to be for free, now you gotta work for it. But I do think that, that's a, that incentives are an important element if you're gonna get to where it is that you wanna get to. The other thing that pe people don't realize is that from the day that you institute some sort of reinforcement, you're looking for how you fade the reinforcement. 
You know, that's, that's a very, <laughs> that's something that if you're, if you're a behaviorist, you're well trained at how to lean out a reinforcement schedule. I, I understand it very well. I can get, I work with kids on the autism spectrum. I can get a kid to do a half hour task for half a pretzel. <laughs> that's a fairly small payoff for a kid who started off with a half a bag of pretzels. It's, it's all in the way that you, you run the program, you know? Casinos understand the principle of leaning out reinforcement <laughs> in, in a spectacularly effective way. How is it that people could go to a slot machine and, and 200 or 300 or 400 or 500 or even 1,000 times pull the arm on that machine and not win and keep playing? Because they're on the perfect partial schedule of reinforcement. Every so often they win. And so. Um, again, when introducing the skill and the target situation, review the specific behaviors expected and, and fade this review to the child. Why do you do that? Because again, it's a behavioral rehearsal. Turn the steps into a picture, word list or, or, uh, to use for review and evaluation. Why? Get yourself out of the picture. The reason why you create an intermediary, a list, a picture, we use iPads and we use a, a scheduling app called ChoiceWorks for younger kids so that their lives are on the iPad. They can, they can see what their responsibilities are day in and day out. They don't need me to remind them. They don't need somebody else to remind them. I like that idea. Kids like that idea. They like it better because the iPad doesn't nag them. <laughs> Whatever it takes. You know, again, you've got to practice regularly. Um, if you have to prompt the child, gradually get rid of the prompt. Substitute something else. That's where the list, the pictures, whatever come into play. Observe the kid when they're performing and, and praise the effort, not success at the task. Why? Because effort will get you very, very sustained and persistent behaviors. And if you only praise success, unless these kids are spectacularly successful at high rates to begin with, the behavior will drop out of their repertoire fairly soon. Reinforce the effort. That's the other thing that I didn't understand with my son when he was young. I would have reinforced effortfulness because that's a very valuable skill, uh, skill for kids to have. Then finally, was the program successful? Get yourself out of it. They don't need you anymore. So I, let me do re room cleaning as the last thing, okay? Because you know, room cleaning is the classic task. It's the classic open-ended, somewhat unstructured task. So the, you know, the director from the parent, clean your room. It says here the response from the child with executive skill deficits. This is a response from most kids. It's, a, it's, it's nothing, you know, it's, it, nothing happens. So. Using this as the prototypical task, you're gonna, you're gonna fulfill your role as an external frontal lobe, okay? You're gonna work with the child. But that's, that's the, the, the essential word, you're gonna work with them. You work with them to develop a plan. So in terms of whenever I'm doing anything with kids and parents, I want the kid to be an active participant. You know, the question comes up about morning routines, I ask, the first question I ask is of the kids, not of the parents. What do you need, what, what happens in the morning? Tell me what you have to do to get ready. Kids know it. They, they, they can tell it to you, you know? So what do you need to do? How do you want your room to be, what do you want it to look like? Where do you want the stuff to go? It's not, do you want to clean your room? You know, that would be a bad question. It's given that you don't have a choice about cleaning your room, how do you want this to operate? That's really what it's all about. But you want them to participate. Let them be decision makers. Why? Because if they make some of the decisions, they'll be more invested in the task. That's fundamental. 
to motivation. If somebody else contributes to something, they're likely to be more excited about doing the task themselves. So give them, develop a way to, to monitor performance. I like, you know, since smartphones, you know, come now with, with you could take panoramic pictures with them, I like that. So we take panoramic pictures of, of, of a finished room. So as the parent, you and the kid clean the room together and then you take a picture of it, and that becomes the exemplar. It needs to look like this. You also have to take a picture of the closets and under the bed. <laughs> That's, yeah, you do have to do that. You have to say, and the closet has to look like this, and under the bed has to look like this. You know, hopefully they didn't hide the stuff in the bathroom or in your room, but. Um, problem solve when something doesn't work. So I'm going to walk, the, walk you through this. Provide encouragement, motivation, and feedback about the success of the approach. Actually, that should be about the effort of the approach. Also, keep in mind, th this is something we've really struggled with, uh, with parents. This is not your standard, you know? Especially if you're a little bit OCD to begin with. You know, your kids are not going to clean to your level of expectation. The fact that they're cleaning at all should make you happy. And so, and it really is, it, it, it's a work in progress. You know, I'm still trying to teach my daughter how to wipe up spills from the floor, you know? And that's what she says to me. This is so much better than it used to be. You know, that's true. Because basically what she used to do is she used to walk out. And, and if you said to her, did you spill anything on the floor? No, I didn't spill anything on the floor. Well, it wasn't me, you know? So she's right, it's, it's better. Decide when the task is completed. The task is completed when the kids met the, the particular exemplar. So here it is. So now you're going to help, the, again, assuming that they're not going to be dying to do this, you know, you're going to help them get started. Are we ready to start? Okay, let's get started. You're doing this as, as the, the parent. Where did you decide your trucks would go? Now you know that the kid had some input into where this stuff is going to be. They've got their own priorities about the way they want their toys arranged. I've got my own priorities about the way that I want my stuff arranged. It drives me crazy. I get home after five days, I can't find anything. You know, because my wife has decided she's going to help me. I don't want that kind of help. You know, I, I don't need it. Uh, was it in the box? How about your dirty clothes? Did, did you decide you, you want to put your dirty clothes in the laundry? Um, and you decided you could put your books in the bookshelf. There are two toys under the bed. It doesn't look like those toys will fit. Where do the other trucks go? What do you think we can do? So now you want to engage the kid in some problem solving. It's quicker and it's easier if you just tell them all this. It's not effective in terms of them becoming uh, independent in these kinds of skills. You're almost finished. Is your plan to play with your friends? You know damn well their plan is to play with their friends. The reason why you say that is a reminder that as soon as this is finished, you can get you play with your friends. But it ain't, you ain't playing with your friends until this is done. You know, but it's, it's a more genteel way of reminding them of the fact that there is a contingency out here. Um, this is a hard job, but you're almost done. Great work. That's the effort piece. You finished your job for the day. So that's, that would be day one, and maybe it's even day 20 and 30 of the room cleaning. You're not doing it every day, but you're going to stay with it. But gradually, you're going to be able to fade your way out of this. How do I know this works? Because we do this with parents. You can get to the point where you can stand in the doorway, you know, and just watch. You want to provide the same information without being the direct agent. A list, picture cues, audio tapes to cue the child. That's why we like pictures or we like those scheduling kinds of apps. Parent says to the child, you know, what do you need to do or why don't you take a look at your list? Parent begins to transfer responsibility to the child. Parents to the child, what do you need to do? So now the, the, in, the question becomes less and less direct because you want the kid to begin to think for themselves about what it is that they have to do. And then finally, transfer is complete. The child now asks himself or herself, what do I need to do? Here's a piece of advice about room cleaning that I didn't put into this particular scenario. It has to happen at a consistent time, at a consistent time of day and on a consistent day of the week. Because if this kind of happens according to what your whim or your schedule is, there's no expectation whatsoever for how this is going to work. 
When I gave you the example about the girl in the working memory in, in, on the Saturday morning, I did that specifically because this kid understands that one of the expectations on Saturday morning is this is a room cleaning time. And if anything good is gonna happen at all, it's not gonna happen until that's done. Run schedules with your kids on a first then basis. The less preferred activity always comes before the more preferred activity. The homework comes before the computer time or Facebook or texting or whatever. You, you've got to set it up that way. You've got to establish that set of expectations. It's effective. It, it's not conflict free, particularly once you get to adolescence, but it's still very effective. So, okay. So let me stop there. We could go, as I say, you know, you, you got the shorthand version of this, but people got questions or comments or anything? And as I say, I'll stay here for individual questions if you want. Yeah. Have you come across cases where you say that the child is the opposite, the child has developed the executive function, and the parent might not, and there is that conflict, and the parent can't actually see that parent himself or self does not have I, it's a rare phenomenon, you know, that I've seen that. You know, I'm typically, uh, well, it, it's rare that parents wouldn't see that as an issue. I mean, they might not develop the executive function, but they, it's rare that they wouldn't see it as an issue. I'm just trying to think about all of the situations I've ever been involved in. I've never seen a situation like that with kids. Oh, actually, I, I take that back. The one time I've seen it with kids, and this is not necessarily a good situation, the kids end up taking over a kind of parenting role, which is not a healthy thing, you know, in that situation. But I can't think of another situation where I've seen that happen, so. I think we'll, uh, thank you. I, oh, was there I, another one? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to ask Paula, she said that you would do the things differently with your son when he was younger, so making him set the goals Having him set the goals, not, you know, I, but yeah, I, he would have set goals. He had goals. Yeah. You know, what he didn't do is, we didn't do the two things. We didn't backward plan to how it was that you would go about doing those things. And it would have, although it would have taken some effort on his part and it would have taken some reinforcement on my part, I, I would have worked with him day in and day out on doing those kinds of things, and I didn't, you know. I think, I really do think it's important to, to be able to do that. And as I say, I mean, one of the advantages you have as a parent is little kids, they still re respect you. They still listen to you. They think that your goals, well, you know, it's, you know my, I'm, see, see, maybe it's changed now. I mean, I, I understand the disrespect from, from 16 or 22 year olds, but if it's getting, if it's down to the level of five and six year olds, it's a different generation. I'm, thank, I'm thankful I'm not there. I see. But, yep. As far as the changing of behaviour, what is the sort of the time frame? There's the example one with the messy rooms. Is this something that's child dependent, of course, but is it expect expectation this is a after five or six efforts or one no. or two months? No. We always think in terms of, of months at least. Um, in part, because, and again, it, it can happen quickly, but you know, I was working by phone with a mom from New Jersey who was trying to set up a morning routine with her daughter. It took 10 months, you know, and, but, but it took 10 months start to finish where the daughter was completely independent. The mother was able to, the mother had to start off in the room. You know, she only got to the, she got to the doorway of the room. It took her probably about two weeks to get to the doorway of the room, but the kid was a train wreck in the morning and the mother was very organized. You know, so there was a little bit of conflict there too. Um, but it, we think in, these are long-term propositions with kids in a lot of cases. You know, and I say that, you know, again, I, you know, like I still work with my, my son on some things, only what he requests at this point. He can tell me what will be helpful to him. And if he thinks that I can do it and, and still be rational about it, then he'll ask me to do it. And so I will still do that to this day. So as long as it's moving along, you know, then, then you're on the right track.
But no, there is no time frame that, that, that there's no kind of typical time frame for kids. Yeah. I'm wondering how old your son is. 28. How old? 28. 28. And whereabouts do parents tend to lose that influence with their kids? And when might they gain it back? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I lost, it with, I lost it with my son when he was 13. And so, and I'm, I'm quite serious about this. We developed a very, very conflictual and very, very confrontive relationship that went on for the next seven or eight years on and off. And it wasn't like that all of the time. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, my son and I, you know, a, a, a friend of mine, um, who I went to see as a therapist, but I went to see her, I said, I, I, I need some help. She said, find some island of, of cooperation that you and your kid can do where you can spend some time together to enjoy yourself. My son and I learned to trap shoot. And so that's what we used to do. We used to go shooting on Sundays. And it, it proved to be a, an invaluable experience for us. Nothing ever came up. And so I think you, gotta, you have to have things like that. The other thing is that, you know, what m my kid, and again, not that, that some of you don't have kids like, my kid was unique in the sense that he's very, very strong-willed. And he was, well. <laughs> and, and so, and what I wanted him to understand was that there were certain have-tos in this world. And the have-tos were, it was around academic performance. I, he went to a, a private Catholic high school. And I did that because I thought if he went to the, a public high school, this is going to be a disaster from day one. And so, and he got along quite well at the high school in terms of academics, because he liked the teachers. They were very invested in what they were doing, and they liked him, you know. He got along horrendously with the administrations, you know. I'll tell you how creative my kid was. The rule was you had to wear a belt with your pants in this school. So he goes in one day, forgets the belt. So the vice principal says to him, that guy had detention for no belt. He comes back a half hour later, and he'd cut all of the belt loops off of my pants. And he said, these are beltless pants. <laughs> and it worked. And he had a whole repertoire of creative strategies like that. <laughs> and so, so, and so did my wife and I. So he had a car, and his first progress report comes out, and he doesn't meet the criteria. And I said the deal was, you know, you, you can't use your car. And, <laughs> and he, doesn't, he doesn't fight about that. But I know he's thinking, there's no way that this is going to happen. At 11 o'clock at night, my wife and I spirited away his car. We hit it 20 miles away. <laughs> and we did that because we knew, and in fact, he did and never found it. He went looking for it. <laughs> and I'm sure he would have learned to hotwire it if he, if, 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 and so, and we had those constant kind of battles, you know, about that. You know, and I, 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 I was insane during some of that time. <laughs> he said he was going to use the car one night. I said he couldn't use the car. I got a splitting mall out of the garage. I said, I'll tell you what, if you get in the car, I'll put the splitting mall through the windshield. So the uh, splitting mall is what you split wood with. I said, I'll put the splitting mall through the windshield, which guarantees you you'll get stopped before you get five miles. You know, and, 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 and he knew at that point that I was crazy enough to do it. <laughs> and so, and I'm not, I, I don't say that with, I mean, they're funny now. They're funny to him, they're funny to me. They were not funny then, they were, they were pretty ugly. We hid, we hid the alcohol. B boys are stupid. <laughs> he has some friends over. They have a sleepover, 15 years old. 
you know, they get into the vodka, they make screwdrivers, they watch TV, they go to bed. They leave the half-filled glasses on the floor. I mean, do I think that they're down there drinking orange juice? No. <laughs> so I lock all of the alcohol in a foot locker, thinking, there you go. We didn't find out, my wife and I didn't find this out, he didn't tell us for a couple of years. He took the pins out of the back of the foot locker and tapped all of the liquor for months <laughs> without us knowing anything about it whatsoever. He was far more invested in could he beat the scheme and, and the creativity that my wife and I showed. But, you know, he, 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 was, he was in National Honor Society High School, did very well. This is a kid, if you don't, I don't know if the kids up here take the SATs. He took the SATs. He had a 750 uh, verbal, 720 math, he had a 790 in history, and a 780 in literature. He was very, very bright. <clears throat> he goes to school in Washington, D.C., at George Washington University, on an early admission for international relations, a fairly tough program to get into. And he, I mean, this is how I know this. He wrote the first chapter of the young adult book now. He spelled out what he did. He said it took me four days to find a liquor store where they wouldn't card me. And he said the police in Washington are far more concerned with other crimes than they are with somebody underage buying liquor. And so he went through George Washington his entire first semester, flunked out. Managed to get into the University of New Hampshire his second semester by telling UNH that his grades were late coming from GW joins an animal house fraternity and failed all of his classes for second semester. He was sitting on a $30,000, we have three surrogate, my kids have three surrogate grandmothers. They're, they're all public school teachers. They squirreled away a lot of money. They gave each of my kids $30,000 for college. My son was sitting on $30,000 that was his money. When he turned 18, he could have done anything that he wanted with it. He signed the check over to us and covered all of his failed courses the first year. You know, and to this day, he is sorry that that happened for him. You know, genuine, and he is genuinely sorry. And so he's been through, you know, as I say, he's, he's taken a lot of hits and he's been through a lot. But bit by bit, over time, He's learned a great deal about himself. And part of the reason why he can write about this stuff, and he's so articulate in the way that he writes about this stuff, is because he understands it from the inside. He brings a perspective to it that I can't even fathom. And that's what makes it valuable. That's what makes it, his vignettes in the teen book valuable. It's what make, what it will make the young adult book valuable. <coughs> because he can write the stories and the stories have a, a sense that, that they're real and they are real because he's lived through those kinds of experiences. So, yeah. Uh, can we just, I think we're gonna, we'll do individual questions, if, that, if that's okay. Uh, I don't, I don't I whatever, can, whatever works for yeah. people, but people yeah. wanna go, yeah, yeah I think I that think that's, you know. Yeah. So. So thank you. On behalf of the group, I just wanna thank Dr. Guare for sharing this. <laughs>